Thank you everyone for standing by and welcome to our May webinar entitled Climate Change Impacts on Wildlife. These webinars are an initiative of the Ohio State University Climate Change Outreach Team, a multi-departmental effort within the university led by Ohio Sea Grant, Office of Research, Ohio Supercomputer, OSU Extension, and eight other OSU departments to help localize the climate change issue for Ohioans and Great Lakes residents. I am Jill Jensis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today are two scientists, Dr. Ben Zuckerberg and Dr. Amy Eiler. Dr. Zuckerberg is Assistant Professor in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. Zuckerman received his PhD from Sunny College of Environmental Science and Forestry and later served as a research scientist at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. His research focuses on how climate change and habitat loss impacts wildlife populations. We're really happy to have him here today. We also have uh, Dr. Amy Eiler, who is a postdoc uh, research associate at the University of Maryland and the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. Currently, she is studying how climate change affects the timing of flowering, plant population dynamics, and hummingbird migration in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. We're really delighted to have both of them here today to talk with us about climate change impacts on specific wildlife species and wildlife in general. But before we start, uh, a few logistical issues. During our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, I will conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to use the chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, and I will collect and pose your questions out to both at the end of their presentations. We have over 200 participants on the webinar so far, a great diverse group representing governmental agencies, academia, and nonprofit groups from the Great Lakes and around the country. Please keep those questions coming throughout your presentation. Oh, please keep those questions coming throughout the presentations and we should have a great Q&A session. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post a webinar survey in the chat feature toward the end of the hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ben Zuckerberg from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, who will pre present assessing the vulnerability of wildlife to climate change. And Ben, you should be all set. Wonderful. Well, great. Thank you very much for this invitation to uh, speak with you today. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, in speaking with both Amy and Christina about what to cover today, I'm going to kind of talk about what I see as being some of the major impacts or ecological impacts of anthropogenic climate change. And in doing so, this is obviously a very wide-ranging topic with numerous examples in it. Um, and I'm really just going to kind of take a couple of um, sort of examples of current research that we have ongoing in our lab. And in doing so, I'd like to kind of rightly point out a couple of my co-authors, Kareem Prince and Lars Pomera, who are um, postdocs in my lab. And so much of what I'm going to show you today is um, parasitizing a lot of their current research. So I'd also like to acknowledge uh, several of our funding sources. A lot of our work are funded by uh, landscape conservation cooperatives and the Northeast Climate Science Center. And then also we spend a lot of time working collaboratively with a number of state agencies to try and really understand basically climate change vulnerability, what species and populations are most vulnerable to the impact of climate change. And so I'd like to acknowledge many of those people that we work with. Um, as, as we all know, uh, this webinar is so focused on trying to assess or, or really reviewing the information on climate change, I'm not going to go into this too much other than to say that certainly what we've been able to document in anthropogenic climate change um, is pretty impressive in terms of rising global temperatures, uh, shifting patterns of precipitation, attenuating winters in the northern hemisphere, uh, the early onset of spring, uh, potentially higher frequency of extreme weather events, and of course, ocean acidification. And as I mentioned, I'm not going to talk about these trends other than to say that um, I think what we are beginning to see is that uh, most of these trends and ch changes are basically beyond the historic range of variability, at least over the last 10,000 years for many species. And so there's this underlying question of what is the ecological response to these changes? 
And I would say that I tend to think about this in four different dimensions. Um, one of them, obviously, is phenology. The fact is that when we're seeing changes in climate, we might be seeing shifts in time or the life history patterns of many species. And because of that, these phenological responses are obviously critical to document. At the same time, we know that species are more or less distributed over geographic space. And we also know that climate has a very important role in basically constraining those distributions. And so how are those distributions changing in response to this warming? At the same time, in terms of when we think about the mechanisms of this, we think about shifts in demography and that these demographic vital rates may, pay, may play a very important role in influencing population dynamics at broad spatial scales. And ultimately, that these can influence biotic interactions and how communities may be shifting over time in response to anthropogenic climate change. So I'm really only going to focus on about three of these. I'm going to leave uh, Amy to talk or, or present her wonderful work in terms of phenological uh, changes in response to climate change. I'm going to focus primarily on distributions, dynamics, and biotic interactions and show some of our current work in that. And I'm actually going to start off talking about distributions and how those may lead to a shift in communities. So ultimately, I think one of the most widely touted lines of evidence that species are in fact responding to modern climate change is this idea of poleward shifts. And the idea here is that if we have a northern hemisphere that is warming over time, and in fact that the northern range boundary of, let's say, a southerly distributed species, uh, theoretically in this, in this example, is constrained by climate, that as that climate changes, we would expect to see a shift, poleward shift, in the distribution of that species over time. And this is really one of the most, even going back to the mid and late 90s, really one of the first telltale signs that species might be responding in a predictable manner to overall to climate change. And what I think we can say now with some measure of confidence is that this pattern seems to be relatively robust. And there was a review by Chen and there are other meta-analyses as well that basically suggests that when we look at latitudinal shifts in species distributions across birds, across insects across mammals, that this shift is in fact occurring in the direction that we would predict it to be. And so Chen's analysis really kind of looks at the, what we see in terms of empirical support for observed latitudinal shifts in relationship to what we expect if they are in fact basically following that climate space. And that shift seems to be fairly robust and resulting in this northward shift of species across sort of taxonomic groups of about 16.9 kilometers per decade. So there's this, um, so the line of evidence suggests that more than half of the observed animal range boundaries have already shown this response to anthropogenic warming. But what I would say underneath that poleward shift is that many species are showing very idiosyncratic responses. That some species are shifting northward as predicted, some species are doing it at very different rates, some of them are not shifting. And so there is this underlying question that I and many others have is, if we have all these individual species that are changing their distributions over time in relationship to climate, then what is the impact on the community or the composition of communities? And so one group of species I spent a lot of time thinking about are wintering birds, um, primarily because I've always thought about these as being sentinels of climate change. They're persisting, as many cold adapted species are, through a time of um, very rigorous conditions. They're constrained or sensitive to climate variability in terms of their use of resources, but also in terms of their, um, their distributions and potentially metabolic constraints. So looking at this group of species, we pose this hypothesis that if there are shifting ranges of individual species, that these ranges and range shifts should result in a reshuffling of communities. So how do we go about measuring this? Well, the idea would be that if you're able to go out and look outside your window during a winter, uh, you might see one community of species in the southeast. And this community of species, as you go up sort of a latitudinal gradient, may actually change if you're in the mid-Atlantic region. And maybe you get some novel species. Maybe a couple other species are dropping out. Maybe there's some slight changes in abundance of certain species. And as you get to the upper Great Lakes, you'll have another group of species. And this species and this shift in community composition sort of captures this component of how might this composition be changing over time and certainly in relationship to climate change. And so the way we go about measuring this is something called a species thermal index, which is basically a functional index that measures the long-term temperature experienced by individual species over its range. 
I'm not going to get into this too much detail, but uh, uh, basically what you're doing is you're taking mean climate data, in this case winter climate, you're combining it with data from uh, some sort of observational data set, in our case Christmas bird count data, and when you basically take this information then, you can actually develop a species thermal index. And so, for example, what this might look like is for the white-breasted nuthatch, and this is, let's say, a northerly adapted, cold adapted species, that this species would basically have a species thermal index of negative uh, 6.77. So capturing its mean or sort of minimum temperature conditions, uh, basically its thermal profile. What's useful about this is that if you've got another species here, and that's more of a subtly distributed species, that this species may have obviously sort of a slightly higher species thermal index. So apparently what you're actually capturing is this different thermal profile between two species. And it is something of a relative measure when you've got a community of species. When you've got this community, then you can develop what's called a community thermal index. So for a species assemblage, it's basically just a balance between cold and warm temperature dwelling species. And again, I'm not going to go too much into detail other than to say that basically what this is saying is that you're summing up all those species thermal indices, you're taking the average, you're just using a current data in one case, and in another case you can actually weight it by abundance to look at some finer scale variation geographically. So we wanted to look then, using this community thermal index, how is this sort of index changing over time? And so we look at data from Project Feeder Watch. I'm a huge proponent of citizen science data. In the case of Feeder Watch, we've got a program that started in 1990. It's been continuing very successfully over the last 22 years or so. And it's got data from about 15,000 participants of people watching and recording what birds are showing up in their backyard throughout the entire winter season. The advantage of this kind of, of this kind of data sets for each individual site then, we can basically identify a community thermal index profile for that community of birds. And if in fact you get one bird showing up or two birds or three or some change in abundance of those birds, then you can document how that community thermal index is changing over time. And so in this case, we've got Carolina Wren popping in and potentially showing a slight increase in that CTI. So what have we found? Um, and this is looking throughout the entire scope of eastern North America. And here we've got community thermal index on the Y and on the X. We've got 1990 to 2012. And over time, we've been seeing an increase in that CTI, basically suggesting that warm adaptive birds are increasing in their dominance throughout eastern North America at many of these sites. What we found that was a little surprising that there's a lot of latitudinal variation in this where we've got increasing CTI at one uh, in the southerly regions, and it's actually attenuating as we get northern, and which was a little counter what we predicted. What we thought was going to happen was that we were going to have higher CTI in the more northerly regions, primarily because that's where we see a lot of the action occurring in the, in the climate data, um, but that's not what we found. Most of the increases in CTI were occurring in the more southerly parts of the eastern U.S. We can also identify which species are driving this. So we do this type of jackknife analysis where we remove species iteratively and recalculate this, uh, this relationship. And just to kind of give you some of the take homes here, what we find is to answer this question, what species are really showing or driving this change in community composition? They are smaller body species that are southerly distributed and increasing in their distribution. So most of what we see as species are driving this trend in CTI, this community, this, this, this pattern of increasing dominance of warm adapted species tend to be smaller body species that are presumably more sensitive to climate variability, subtly distributed and increasing in their occupancy. Okay, I'm gonna take a quick shift here then, uh, talking uh, from distributions and biotic interactions now to dynamics and shifts in demography. And part of the reason I really want to talk about this is this idea of climate change vulnerability. And when we talk about vulnerability, I think there are two main impacts or components that we try to assess and uh, evaluate. One of them is this idea of sensitivity. 
So this primarily captures this idea that all species have vita rates that are more or less sensitive to climate variability. And so we talk about survival rates or we talk about reproduction. And so when we talk about wildlife, there really needs to be a better sense of which of these vital rates are more or less sensitive to climate variability. At the same time is this component of exposure. And when we think about this geographically, different populations are more or less exposed to historic and future climate variability. So the idea is if we can take some sort of mechanism or modeling framework where we can use demographic components as well as look at this over broad spatial scales and geographic variation, we can have a better sense of trying to evaluate that vulnerability and over time try to gauge those conservation efforts that both incorporate this idea of which demographic rates are most sensitive to climate variability and which populations are most exposed to historic and future climate variability. So the one example I'm going to point out, we've got a project where we're looking at multiple species to do this, but I'm just going to kind of show you one example here, which is for rough grouse. So this is a cold adapted species who really shows a very interesting sort of population characteristic uh, that is demographically driven, which is population cycling. And so a number of cold adapted species show these cycling events, uh, snowshoe hare, lynx, and others, where you've got in this case, we have northern Minnesota wetlands, populations of rough grouse that cycle very strongly. And then as you go down in latitude, and this is a very common pattern, you see this attenuating uh, impact of cycling, where they don't cycle quite as much in southerly regions. So here we've got um, potentially a species that's showing weaker cycling in the south of its regions and stronger cycling in the north. And some really interesting work is beginning to kind of surface right now, suggesting that a lot of these sort of classical population cycles that we know in ecology tend to be strongly driven by climate. And not only that, but that many of these cycles, potentially throughout the world, are actually beginning to dampen over time. And part of that dampening in their cycling may have a very strong climate link. So the first act component is sensitivity. One of the first things we try to do is try to look at what's been collected empirically um, from studies in terms of adult and juvenile survival of nest success. So Lars, who's really leading the way on this kind of work, uh, basically uh, is able to collect information from roughly about 17 studies where we've got data on survival and fecundity and then associate that with climate variability. Once we do that then, what we're trying to basically estimate is this demographic niche space. So what we can imagine here is that those sort of um, those green areas are areas where we expect sort of low expected survival. So rough grouse are, um, require these snow roofs. Um, it has a very important effect on their overwinter survival. And so what you can imagine in terms of both precipitation and temperature throughout the winter season is that sort of warm rainy conditions are not great for sustaining these snow roofs and for their ability to survive both predators and inclement climate. And sort of cold conditions are also not great because you've got low snow potentially. What you're really trying to get is that diagonal there, cold high snow and warm low snow conditions. And that's really trying to get that sort of sweet spot of survival for this species. When we look at the survival data, and this is kind of, um, it, uh, I'm not going to get into the details of this too much, but this is basically a GAM projection where we're looking at non-breeding survival, and it's very strongly influenced by minimum temperature and minimum precipitation. And we're able to parameterize this space using all those black dots, which is basically those 17 studies there. And what you can kind of see there a little bit is that, that milder winter temperatures and basically that precipitation, which is generally associated with rain, is that sort of upper right-hand corner there, which we basically is that low survival. So you want to stay out of that, those green areas, which is kind of that death valley. We can take that information then and incorporate it into a demographic model, and we can look at this variability geographically now over time. And what I can kind of show you here is about 30 years of that model of survival, survival rate, and that's non-breeding survival through the winter. And you can see how much that oscillates in these three different regions throughout the upper Midwest. We can do the same thing with fecundity, nest success, and you can see about 70% 70 70 of that variation is explained by temperature and precipitation. It's almost a little bit more unimodal 
basically you want to stay away from those extremes of summer temperature, both either too cold or too hot for the species, and it's an anomaly. That's why it's centered on zero. But I just want you to kind of just focus on this idea that that oscillatory behavior is much more reduced in nest success. There's a lot less variability. Much of it tends to be driven primarily by survival. So that is that component of sensitivity. We are able to look at vital rates. We're able to look at see how those vital rates are potentially influenced by climate variability, in this case, winter precipitation, summer precipitation, uh, and temperature. And once we incorporate that, what we can do then is now look at that exposure component by incorporating it into spatially explicit demographic models, and we can have time series, basically, projections of populations over time. The real advantage to this, then, is that we can use those data and make it spatially explicit and then compare them to monitoring data. So here we've got rough grouse spring drumming surveys from over 300 survey routes throughout Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And so we compare our model output to these monitoring data. And what you see there, those, those colored lines are basically the output from, from our models, and then the, the dotted lines are the output from the monitoring data. And I'd say that we have pretty strong concordance, and really what it captures and one of the strongest components is that even though our models are almost primarily driven sort of loosely by land cover, but also by primarily dynamic climate variability, that just sort of doing that alone captures this oscillatory behavior, especially in the north where we see stronger cycling and then sort of dampened oscillations in the south. The night thing about this in terms of trying to get to that exposure then is we can model our future variability in, in these cycling dynamics using some of the future forecast data. And that's really advantageous, primarily because what we're beginning to see here is that a lot of that variability in population cycling is not going to go away, but it potentially is going to become more stochastic over time. And that potentially represents a problem, because if you have areas or populations that are highly synchronized, showing more variability in that sort of up and down cycling, you could potentially have these more likelihood of sort of localized extirpation events. And so here, just showing one year in those sort of upper regions of Minnesota there, you can see basically those pink areas being sort of higher likelihood of population extirpation. And so, that's probably one of the more sort of salient points I'd like to make is that population dynamics are driven by climate variability and potentially with something like cycling are only going to become more intense and more variable over time. So with that, I'll kind of leave you with a few sort of take-homes notes. One is that poleward shifts are definitely something that we're seeing really throughout the world and for multiple species and taxa. We believe we're showing some evidence here of reshuffling of species and communities, especially for wintering birds. But honestly, there's been really interesting evidence on predator communities as well. That when we think about vulnerability of species, I think we have to really consider this idea of sensitivity and exposure. We understand and appreciate that weather climate influences vital rates. And so trying to get a better sense of which vital rates and which demographic parameters are most sensitive to this variation is critical. And I would say we have to feed that into the assessment of exposure. Different populations are going to be more or less exposed, not only historically in terms of their adaptive capacity, but also in terms of sort of their future, uh, future conditions and future climate variability. And ultimately, this influences population dynamics. And in, in my case, I'm just showing this example of cycling, but I think other population dynamics stand out as well, that when we have increased variability in the climate system, potentially many of these components, such as population cycling, are also going to be influenced and could lead to higher extinction risk. And with that, I'd be happy to turn it over to Amy. Great. Thank you, Dr. Zuckerberg. Um, I will uh, – let me get – um, Amy's presentation up. Uh, Amy, I think you are unmuted. I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Amy Eiler from the University of Maryland uh, and the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory, who is, will present climate change effects on broad-tailed hummingbirds. Amy, I think you're all set. Great. Thank you, Jill. And thank you, Ben, for that uh, very interesting presentation. 
And um, again, thanks for the invitation to be here. I'm excited to tell you today about, um, I'm going to focus on a case study of how climate change is affecting the timing of hummingbird migration relative to their floral resources. And so, um, as Ben already mentioned um, and covered really well, we're seeing um, two really prominent biological responses to climate change include um, rain shifts, species moving toward the poles, and shifts in phenology. And today I'll be talking about um, shifts in phenology. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, just very briefly, phenology is the timing of life history events, ranging from when trees leaf out in the spring, when animals go into or out of hibernation, uh, the timing of migration, and also when organisms reproduce, which I'm showing here as flowering. And why we care about phenology, very broadly speaking, is that it very hugely determines the survival and the reproductive success of um, organisms. So if I could give you an example with flowering, if a plant species flowers too early in a temperate habitat, um, it risks being exposed to harsh abiotic conditions. And that could lead to, for example, frost damage. So one kind of counterintuitive effect of climate change that we're seeing, especially up in the mountains, is increased frost damage to developing flower buds. And that's because these plants are flowering earlier, and now um, they're flowering at a time when nighttime temperatures can still get pretty cold and colder than what they've historically experienced. And this kind of decreased floral abundance as a result of frost damage has implications for wildlife that depend on plants for flowers um, and for, for food. So like ground squirrels, marmots, deer, and in this case today, we're probably talking about hummingbirds. And we know that phenology by and large is becoming earlier in many organisms. So the figure I'm showing you here is from a meta-analysis um, that was published a few years ago, and it's in taxa across the United Kingdom. So we see, first of all, these negative bars indicating earlier phenological events. And then the other thing I want you to notice about this graph, then, is that the phenological shifts differ, differ among groups of organisms. So we see plants advancing at a faster rate, on average, than invertebrates, and those, in turn, advancing at a faster rate than vertebrates. So what this points to, then, um, is the possibility for what we call a phenological mismatch. And that's um, organisms in different trophic levels that depend on one another may be becoming mistimed. And <clears throat> I'm going to show some figures today um, that look more like this line graph on the right. So you see um, the day of appearance versus year. And that's now change through time just basically converted into a, um, a regression style approach. So we see the steepest amount of change in the plants relative to the other groups of organisms. And so we see this widespread evidence across a very broad geographic area for different rates of change in organisms. But if we really want to address this, we need to have data on organisms that we know interact um, at the same location. And so um, I'll be talking about that today from one location in the Rocky Mountains and in the um, Tucson mountain ranges. But before I get to that, I want to mention why might these organisms change their phenologies at different rates? And that's because they depend on different environmental cues for different life history events. So two big ones, as Ben alluded to, are um, temperature and precipitation. And that precipitation can fall as rainfall or snow melt, depending on the season. And of course, these are two abiotic factors that we're seeing changing um, very rapidly, not only on average, but increasing variability. So that could be also contributing to this potential for phenological mismatch in different organisms. And today I'll be focusing, um, as Jill mentioned, on the broad-tailed hummingbird. And if you want to find the paper, this work um, it was published in Ecology um, in 2012 in volume number 93. And so this is a male broad-tailed hummingbird found feeding on a, an Ipomopsis flower. And this is the range of the broad-tailed hummingbird. Shown here, there's two subspecies in the, um, <clears throat> in the purple here, 
is um, a species, a subspecies that doesn't migrate, but today we'll be focusing on the broad-tailed hummingbird populations that do migrate. So they overwinter in Mexico, and then they spend their summers anywhere from um, southern Mexico up through the northern U.S. Um, in the west. And so what's interesting when we think about the phenology of a migratory animal is that they have to integrate cues along their entire um, migration route. And for birds, a lot of birds uh, use photo period or day length as a cue for when they leave their overwintering grounds. And in the case of the hummingbird then, they're highly dependent on flowers for nectar. So when they're making that migration up to this you know, yellow area um, in the map that I'm showing here on the slide, they're going to have to track the nectar resources available to them. <clears throat> And one big thing we're seeing is that phenological shifts are bigger at higher latitudes. So we expect to see the change in flowering um, advancing at a faster rate at more northern latitudes compared to more southern latitudes. So you might expect a scenario where the hummingbird is kind of being held up on its migratory pathway because of the different rates of change and their timing of flowering for their food resources. And so that's the main question we're going to focus on, is are broad-tailed hummingbirds mismatched with their floral food resources at the northern limits of their summer breeding ranges? <clears throat> and so we've got data from two sites, as I mentioned, in the Rocky Mountains in Gothic, Colorado, which is where I am currently, and then also in Tucson, Arizona, near the southern um, part of their breeding range, at least in the United States. And so in Arizona, the first Nectar resource available to them is Indian paintbrush, shown as the red flowers here. And then in Colorado, the first two species available to them are the glacier lily and larkspur. And we, um, I owe having these great data sets to these amazing natural historians shown here. Dave Bertelson collects the data in Arizona. My postdoc advisor is David Inouye, who has been following flowering um, in Gossett, Colorado for the past 40 years. And Billy Barr, who also lives in Gothic, has been tracking the hummingbird migration. So that's where our data come from. And be before I show you how the phenology of these organisms is changing, I just briefly want to mention a little bit about how the climate is changing at these two areas. And this is what the Arizona sites look like here. Let me get my next slide. There we go. And then our precipitation. This is precipitation anomaly. So I'll walk you through this slide. Um, in the green bars are the first of the earliest parts of the data set in the 80s to the early 90s. We see wetter than average um, across all seasons, so starting from October through September. And then in the middle part of the range in the, in the mid-90s, we see some variation. And then what I really want to point out is the most recent years, we see drier than average conditions, especially in the fall and in the early spring. And this is what the field site looks like in Colorado. And we have temperature and snow melt information. So the graph on the, on the left shows that temperatures are increasing in the summer. And when the snow melts in the spring is also becoming earlier. And up here in the mountains, this is a really important phenological cue. And we see that over the past um, 40 years or so, the timing of snow melt is advancing by about three and a half days every decade. And so how do all of these changes in climate affect our flowers and our hummingbirds? Oh, and here's a picture from our, um, <laughs> this is where I'm currently living. And I just like to point out, if you're not familiar with um, mountain ecosystems, snow melt is a hugely important ecological factor. It provides a huge amount of water into the system in the spring. And obviously, things can't get going in the spring until all of that snow melts, especially for um, flowering plants. So first, we'll move, we'll follow the pathway of the hummingbird in Arizona. What we see here um, is that the day of appearance of the hummingbird, shown in red, and the Indian paintbrush flowers, shown in pink, no, neither one of those are changing through time. So we just see a bunch of scatter. And then if we subtract the timing of arrival and relative to the timing of onset of flowering. Again, there's no change at all. Um, the hummingbird is arriving more or less the same time 
which is when the flowers are beginning to flower. So in Arizona, things are timing up well. Now if you look at Colorado, we see a slightly different picture. And here's the first species to flower shown in yellow that you're throwing on this the glacier lily. And the hummingbird again is in red. So we see that the glacier lily is flowering about five and a half days um, earlier every decade, relative to the hummingbird who is arriving only about one and a half days earlier every decade. And what that means then is that there's fewer days between hummingbird arrival and flowering onset. And I'll show you a similar picture for the, uh, the, for the larkspur, the purple flower. Again, we see um, the flowering is advancing at a faster rate than the hummingbird migration is advancing, leading to fewer days between hummingbird arrival and onset of flowering. And your first um, question might be, isn't that a good thing? There's fewer days between when the hummingbirds arrive and when the flowers begin. And that is a very um, legitimate question. <clears throat> However, what we see in these hummingbirds is that the first individuals to arrive in the spring are the males. And they're extremely territorial. So they want to arrive and set up their breeding territories early. And historically, that has occurred about two weeks before flowering starts. And now we're seeing the males arriving um, with much less time to set up their territory. And we think what could be happening then is that might be squeezing their time frame of reproduction into a smaller window. So putting this back all together then, this supports our original hypothesis that hummingbirds are becoming mistimed with floral resources at the northern site, but not at the southern site. And we expect this convergence in phenology to continue for some time given that we're seeing um, these, pretty fast rate, these pretty fast rates of change in flowering species <clears throat> without any evidence of slowing down yet. <clears throat> and we think, as I mentioned, this late arrival is probably going to shorten their time frame for reproduction. And we're trying to follow up on this by following hummingbird nests. So we have some historic data that we can follow, we can compare to, and we know that historically the females start to breed when the first um, larkspur flowers arrive. And now we're seeing some years where that's when the, male, and the males are only arriving a few days before those larkspurs begin to flower. So that would suggest that the, the females also are kind of falling behind schedule. But that remains to be seen. And before I want to wrap it up then, we know a little bit about changes in phenology of other wildlife at this site in particular. So um, the hummingbirds aren't the only species that um, are showing some very slight changes in their arrival signs. The American robin, pictured here on the right, we know we see a very slight change in its um, its date of first sighting. So it's becoming earlier, but not at a usually fast rate. It's actually pretty similar to the hummingbird. And in terms of when the marmots come out of hibernation, that's also becoming earlier. And what we ultimately would like to do is link these changes in phenology to some type of um, demographic consequence like Ben was showing. And for the marmots, there was a great study that came out a few years ago doing just that, showing that this earlier arrival um, or earlier emergence from hibernation in the spring is leading to the marmots being active for a longer growing season. So they basically have a longer summer in which to eat and fatten up for the winter. And they saw a very big population increase because of this effect. So for the marmots, they're actually doing better under this climate change scenario. And with that, I think that finishes up the phenology section. And I think Ben and I are both happy to take any questions from the audience. OK, thank you, Amy. That was great. Uh, I, we've gotten a lot of uh, questions. So let me just uh, get started here. And we have Ben unmuted. So. Um, and what I think I'll try to do, since I think there's several questions that probably both of you um, will either want to or can answer, I'll pose it out to first Ben and then Amy if you want to add anything more. Um, if there's specific ones for you, Amy, then I'll directly um, ask you if that works for both of you. Works fine for yeah. me. Okay, Sounds great. great. Um, we have had several uh, questions dealing with um, plant communities 
and animals. So let me uh, ask you, uh, one specific question was, have we seen similar poleward shifts in the plant communities associated with these animals? And are there plants that these birds rely on that would, that would affect their ecological impact? I think this might be more, I think this was directly for, from Ben's presentation, but I'm sure, Amy, you can add to it. Um, I, I, so let's see, as an avian ecologist, I'm always a little hesitant to throw too much weight behind what I say about plant communities. But I do think that, yes, I think uh, there has been pretty strong evidence. I think there, the temporal scale is obviously a little bit different, and I think a lot of these meta-analyses and uh, these kind of original meta-analyses were a few years ago, I want to say, that looked at fingerprints or footprints of climate change. And um, these poleward shifts was definitely one of them. And I think a lot of the studies came from Europe primarily, um, looking at poleward shift in plant communities. Um, I know that in some modeling frameworks, there's been a lot of interesting sort of um, the distribution models that try to look at how plant communities will change over time from a, just in terms of modeling niche space. And most of that is seeing sort of this sort of more, at least in the upper Midwest, sorry, um, region sort of more shift to northern hardwoods and sort of a degradation of more conifer adapted communities. But Amy, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, um, see what you think about that. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think you answered it uh, very well, especially pointing to the temporal difference and what Ben means then, of course, is that, you know, plants aren't quite as mobile, so they have to disperse their seeds and then have germination to establish new populations. And I think that um, there is some information suggesting that that does happen indeed, as you would expect, at a slower rate than, than with the animals. And, and I think a really interesting question then is what what that means for the animal communities. Um, how do they switch to new resources? Are they limited by their plants? You know, we don't really know a lot about that, I don't think. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Amy, this is uh, a question directed toward, for you um, from a middle school class. Uh, why do you think, why, are you, why do you think you aren't seeing similar hummingbird data in Arizona that you are in Colorado? Oh, good question. And that's actually, the pattern we saw was what we expected to see. And we think it's because um, we're not seeing as rapid of changes in the, the flowering time in Arizona. And actually, some of those plant species are even showing delayed flowering because of the droughts that are being experienced in that region. So the droughts are leading to delayed flowering, which is kind of the opposite of what we're used to hearing about climate change and flowering. Um, and so that's one reason that we're seeing a different thing happening in Arizona than in Colorado. Thank you. Um, yeah. I have another question, and I think it was um, during, uh, Ben, your presentation. Um, a question dealing with uh, Chen's study, people were wondering if that was global or if that was solely in the U.S. Uh, I believe that was global. Okay. Uh, another question um, is dealing with the uh, CTI, and thank you for everyone who clarified what CTI, Community Temperature Index, was. I didn't know what it was. Um, Here's the question. Could the reduction of the CTI as you go northward be a lag related to a slower vegetation change? Huh, that's a good question. Um, it, I, I would probably say probably not in that um, I, I would say most of those species that we were looking at are species that um, – are considered to be somewhat generalists in that they can take advantage of um, very different kind of cover types or vegetation or plant communities. Um, all of these species are kind of more or less at least able to survive in human uh, 
sort of adapted or human modified landscapes um, like suburban areas and even some urban areas. So I, I would probably say that it's probably not plant communities. But what I would say is that, and I think we're still trying to get a sense of this, is that some birds, uh, if you kind of sort of map their where they like to be in terms of their climate space and then see how that climate space has moved over time and then see how well some of these wintering birds can actually track that climate space. You know, some really neat work by a guy named Frank Lasort uh, um, has basically shown that sometimes it takes them anywhere. They can track it pretty much from one winter to another, but some years it takes them 30 years to shift along with that climate space. So even species that we think about, with um, like birds that can fly and they're very mobile, even sometimes it takes them a, a long time in order to track that climate space. Great, thank you. Um, a few uh, questions dealing with hummingbirds. Uh, one question uh, is, uh, does the data from the hummingbird and I think it's marmot, sorry, I'm not a bird person, and Robin from 2000 to present day follow the trend in phenology shift? Um, I'm not sure I quite understand. So does it follow the global trend or? Yeah, just um, it's, so, yeah so the those trends that we're seeing in terms of earlier emergence of marmots, slightly earlier arrival of the birds. Um, okay, I can answer that in two ways. Um, the marmots and the flowers, for example, those are fairly similar to kind of global averages. The birds, these two species in particular, are maybe a little bit slower to change relative to the average. I think is more around three days per decade earlier, and these are more like one day, one and a half days per decade. And so the hummingbird, as I explained, we think that might be because their floral resources could be holding them up at least through time. And for the robin, um, it could be a similar thing if they rely on bud break and, you know, when the worms and caterpillars and then things that they eat become available. Great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, another question dealing with um, uh, that was within your uh, presentation, Amy. Uh, we are seeing frost damage in Michigan well away from mountains. Is increased frost damage a documented North American or global problem or perhaps just a coincidence? Oh, yes, good question. I did misspeak a little bit in that it is a, a documented phenomenon, um, certainly across North America. I know in Michigan they lost a lot of their cherry crops. and so. This is a phenomenon that's affecting not only natural plant communities, but also some crop species um, like apricots, cherries, things that flower early in the season in the spring are all experiencing this problem. So it's a, it's a fairly um, widespread phenomenon. And in Europe, it's happening as well. Great, thank you. Uh, ben, a couple questions for you. Uh, one question is, can you discern changes in wildlife distribution with changes in land use, the latter which may also be driven by climate change? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it's something that uh, we're continuing to look at. Um, so my, my feeling on this is that these two impacts of climate change and land use change are not uh, working separately, that they tend to be synergistic. Um, and uh, one really good example of this is, a, is another study that we've recently uh, wrapped up and it's coming out in Global Change where we looked at very similar approach uh, um, uh, that kind of shows grouse but with um, eastern Massasauga rattlesnake, which is a species that's declining uh, significantly throughout its range. And what we were really kind of able to see is that when we try to look at how climate variability influences the persistence of these populations of snakes throughout the upper Midwest, we can really do a much better job when we incorporate information on like agricultural development or on land cover. And in fact, when we only looked at just climate variability alone, and then when we separately only looked at just land use change alone, 
we didn't do a very good job. When we incorporated those two components, that's when we were able to actually have fairly strong predictions of which populations are more or less at threat. So I would say that it's a, it's a really sort of an area that we're all trying to explore in many different ways, and I think that's a really good example because in some cases when we talk about things like drought or when we talk about extreme flooding events, those can be the magnitude of those events can be very much influenced by the surrounding land use, whether it's agricultural or urban development. And so I think it's a, it's a good question. It's something that's a fairly, actually somewhat difficult to be able to tease apart, but, um, but we're, we're doing our best with it. Another question, Ben, uh, for you. Um, do you have any, can you talk a little bit about uh, possibly any information on like Great Lakes amphibians or reptiles? Ooh, ouch. <laughs> oh, is that beyond beyond I what think, you? Yeah, I could probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, I wanted to make sure, and and I thought so, but I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Sure. We will we will skip that that. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question that we had was, um, and again, this is for for you, Ben. Um, was dealing with, and I'm sorry. Now, of course, I have missed it. Um. Why do you think the CTI has remained stagnant in the Great Lakes region? Has there been little change in community composition in this region, or have warm adapted immigrants been offset by uh, extirpation or of other warm adapted species? Um, yeah, it's a really good question, and it's something that, honestly, we, we didn't expect to find. We actually expected that CTI, this Community Thermal Index, which is, you know, as I was kind of talking about, is this balance of warm versus cold adapted species, that we'd be seeing most of it occurring kind of in the Great Lakes region um, and in other parts of, let's say, the northeastern United States. What I would say a little bit is that, Potentially, what we're what I think is really driving this pattern, and I think it's going to kind of begin to percolate up north as well, is that a lot of this is driven by very sort of changes in abundance of subtly distributed species, and so and most of it tends to be driven by colonization, uh, increasing species in terms of their distribution and abundance, as opposed to let's say you know, uh, really cold adapted species sort of becoming extirpated or leaving. Uh, we don't see a lot of information on that. Not to say that that's not occurring, but what it really does seem to be driven by is a sort of colonization impact of southerly adapted species, of warm adapted species. So, um, and I just, in, at least in my thought about it a little bit, is that um, what we do tend to sort of need, or at least it seems like, for some of these birds to kind of catch up to their climate space is actually a bit of a hiatus in a warming. Uh, when you do have sort of these periods where the warming is kind of taking a long-term sort of break from its trend. And in the southeast, that's actually been noticed to some extent. So we are kind of interested in whether or not eventually that sort of CTI change will eventually just kind of percolate up to the north, which we expect it to. Great. Thank you, Ben. Um, and a question that we had gotten for, um, Amy, this is for you. Uh, are hummingbirds significant um, pollinators? And if so, how has the hummingbird population affected plant populations in the Colorado area? Yes, um, hummingbirds are very important pollinators, especially of those two plant species I showed you. So um, the those two species are pollinated primarily by hummingbirds and by queen bumblebees, which are really the only things out that are good pollinators early in the season for those plant species. And we don't have information on um, the success of those species or their population dynamics, unfortunately. So it's, it's hard to say for certain. I would say um, so far we're not seeing any, any huge signs um, pointing to declines, and I think one thing that we might see is very strong selection eventually um, against earlier flowering if those individuals don't get pollinated and aren't successful. So hopefully there's kind of a buffer um, built in, but that, that remains to be seen. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, Amy, for 
you um, dealing with uh, snow events uh, in hummingbirds, if a significant snow event hits the hummingbirds when they are setting up territories, they wake up with no food. Do they do these early males die or can they retreat and come back later? We um, are fairly confident that the males retreat and we think they even they live they kind of temporarily set up camp down at a lower elevation where there are some flowers and then they make scouting trips during the day and then once there are enough flowers at, at the higher elevation where they have their breeding territories then they assume residence and stay overnight and they go into torpor um, when it gets really cold and so they're kind of at a you know their metabolism is reduced um, they're, they're pretty amazing little creatures and they can withstand pretty cold temperatures and so um, the reason we think they do that is because we don't see them very early in the morning or very late in the day until there are flowers here at, on site. Otherwise, we think they're, they're making little scouting trips. But great question. Uh, another question that we had um, was dealing with habitat management implications for really for both of your research. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, what maybe some of those habitat management implications are um, with respect to wildlife species and is monitoring the most important aspect for now? And Ben, I'll start with you, I guess. Sure, yeah, I would say that a lot of our vulnerability assessment work um, has kind of focused both for rough grouse but also for eastern Mossasaga rattlesnake. Um, I think there's significant implications for habitat management and um, primarily because for two very different reasons that I kind of mentioned before and I, I kind of didn't show this work but with the rattlesnake work you know we really do kind of show that the amount of our cultural uh, impact in an area surrounding an area does uh, in some ways uh, exacerbate these climate effects. And so trying to get a sense of water table management in the case of the rattlesnakes, uh, but also just how to limit land use change around these areas or how to sort of basically buffer them from sort of climate extremes is really critical. For the rough grouse, I'd say too that, you know, part of the cycling phenomenon does have a component of um, that the cycling is decreased in areas like that are fragmented by forest uh, or forest fragmentation. And so trying to have a better sense of, you know, when we do see these climate conditions or, or how climate mediates some of these sort of demographic consequences, um, trying to understand how it works interactively with forest fragmentation in that case or even with uh, forest maturation processes is something that I think has really strong habitat management implications. Yeah, and in, in terms of the hummingbirds, and their phenology. This is so. This is only one population, and we would love to have more information on multiple populations. And that is where monitoring becomes hugely important. And I really can't underestimate how important mon ecological monitoring is. Um, it's been great with um, a lot of more investment in citizen science types of monitoring, especially for phenology. We're able to get more information, but it yet yeah, it's, it's fairly um, tricky to make a habitat management recommendation based on one population at this point. Um, so I would, yeah, I would, I would emphasize monitoring right now, at least for this species in particular. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'll also double down on that monitoring aspect too, that um, it, it, none of this would be possible, I think, without long-term monitoring data, both in terms of uh, being able to kind of validate some of the models but also for the citizen science data, if those people weren't out there collecting those data as they have been for the last 20 years, we would really have nothing to say. Okay, thank you. Um, we had a few more uh, questions uh, dealing with um, hummingbirds and, um, and research that is going on about what could happen to hummingbirds in the Great Lakes region. There were a couple people 
from like the Michigan area that were asking about uh, their hummingbird species. And I don't know, Amy, if you would be able to comment on any of, of research going on uh, specifically in the Great Lakes region. I honestly don't know um, about the hummingbirds in that, in that region. Yeah, I think there's probably some opportunity to use some of the eBird data to get at some of those questions. I'm not, but I'm not aware of any any present studies. Okay, okay. Um, I think um, those are the majority of the questions that we have. I'm trying to, sorry, I'm trying to kind of go through and make sure um, that I'm not missing a, ma a key uh, question. But I think actually that is uh, those that is the majority of the questions. We really appreciate uh, both of you answering all these questions. We had 20 minutes of questions and answers. That was great. Thank you. We really appreciate that. Um, well, I would so I would like to actually close, and we will um, uh, conclude this webinar. I want to again thank Dr. Zuckerberg and Dr. Eiler for their willingness to talk to us about their work. It was really an excellent discussion. Also, a thank you to Ohio State University, the National Sea Grant College Program, and Ohio Supercomputer for funding this webinar. I did want to remind you that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature, so please feel free to take a few minutes to fill that out. I also wanted to refer you to resources and an archive of all previous webinar presentations which are located on our changingclimate.osu.edu website as well as our new regional site at greatlakesclimate.com. This webinar series is sponsored by the OSU Climate Change Outreach Team and will continue next month with scientists from Ohio State University who will be discussing farming, urban development, and climate change in, in Lake Erie. The registration is up in the chat. Thank you again to Ben and Amy and all the participants on this webinar. We hope that this was beneficial and hope you'll join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you again, Ben and Amy. That was a great presentation. And everyone, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.